This is unscripted. I don't know what we're going to talk about exactly. Um, you, you have a book that you've written. It's, it's a pretty new book by that title, Lies We Believe About God. But in one way, you've already written that book, and it's called The Shack. Correct. Yep. So, I don't know, just, just start us off with a little bit about, about maybe... I mean, you're saying in explicit nonfiction prose in Lies We Believe About God, what you've already portrayed uh-huh. in the shack. And so that, that didn't just come out of your head, that came out of your life, I'm guessing. Sure. Um, and I wanted to write a piece of nonfiction so that my detractors could, <laughs> wouldn't accuse me of hiding behind fiction anymore. Yeah. It's a joke. It's okay. <laughs> It's kind of true, too. I've gotten as much good theology from fiction as from nonfiction. And, and you will. Yeah. Otherwise, Jesus would never have taught in parables. There you, go. Yeah. you know, the, the beauty of a parable is that it's true. It's just not real. And when people, would, mm-hmm. when people would say about the shack, is this true? I'd say, absolutely. It's just not real. Yeah. Like any parable. And story has a way of sneaking past our watchful dragons, as Lewis would say. Because we all have our paradigms, those glasses that we look through and determine the whole universe, including the character and nature of God. And, uh, and they become a, the guards of our minds that keep our hearts separated from healing. And, um, and those paradigms are what the Holy Spirit is after, either to change the prescription or to give you a new set of glasses. And um, so story has this unbelievable power to slip past and hit you in the heart before your mind can engage. And I had a lot of folks that would read the shack and they would want to be in the, the embrace of Papa God before they realized she was a large black African-American woman. And then their heads would engage and go like, there's a problem here. <laughs> you know, God the Father is a woman. And, uh, and like I said to you, uh, when people have a problem with it, I always say, is it the black part or the woman part? Yeah, I mean, people say... Yeah. <laughs> Well, 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 God isn't really a black woman, is he? He's not really a white man either. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and, but again, you know, imagery wasn't intended to help us define God. It was to give us a window th- through which to look at the nature and character of God. And frankly, Gandalf with a bad attitude, God is not a good window. Mm. And a lot of us <laughs> grew up with that man. And, um, and so we, we yeah. grow up with a, with that kind of, with a negative image of God who is angry, displeased, mm-hmm. prone at times to be violent and retributive. And we can inherit that image from God from people who had the best of intentions. Absolutely. And I think most of the time people have the best of intentions, yeah. but their intentions then get wrapped up into their damage. And, um, mm-hmm. I mean, my dad Love Jesus. There's no question about you it. You grew up as a missionary, missionary kid. kid, preacher's kid. But, you know, when you're, a, when you're a child and your father is a violent and abusive disciplinarian, um, you don't realize his story. You don't know his story. So you just make the assumption that his fury is your fault and because he's the righteous man. And, uh, and it's so easy to project the damage that we've experienced in our lives um, onto the face of God. And one of the ways that I've talked about my experience, particularly with my dad, because you wrap his fury inside of religious theological language, and now it's really confusing. And you end up with a God who's like my dad. And thankfully, Jesus came to save me from God the Father. And, um, and that became my theology. And so I had a very different perspective of the nature of God as Father than the person of Jesus who came we to save We can kind of me. warm up to Jesus, but the, yeah. that image of the Father is threatening, imposing, and Jesus stands between us and certain doom. Correct. Because they're of two different characters. God the Father needs sacrifice, needs appeasement, needs justice. And, uh, and, and Jesus loves and justice us. is always understood as punishment. R- punishment, retributive, yeah. punitive. And, uh, and it, took me, it took me all of 50 years to wipe the face of my own father off the face of God. And that was part of my theological journey as well. So when I wrote a story for my kids, which is all I was trying to do, was try to get it done for Christmas as a Christmas present. And uh, I got it done and I made my 15 copies at Office Depot. 
that did everything I ever wanted that book to do. I was trying to say to my kids, in story, let me tell you about the God who actually showed up and healed my heart, mm. not the God I grew up with. Because the God that I grew up with, I couldn't trust him. You know, he, anybody that would beat, his, beat the hell out of his own son in order to be right with other people, how can you trust someone who you don't know loves you or is not good all the time? And that tampers with the real fundamental question for many of us. Is God good all the time? And that becomes a really basic question for a lot of us. If you get stuck with an idea that God is angry, violent, and retributive, and that Jesus saves us from God, mm -hmm. instead of revealing God as Savior, Jesus saves us from God, then it's, it's as if in the, pro, the parable of the prodigal son, you would need to insert this part, and, and the father, seeing the son at a great distance, ran to the slave quarters and beat the hell out of some servant and appeased his wrath, and then went and embraced his son. But that's not in the parable. Uh, Jesus doesn't yeah. save us from God. He reveals God as Savior. He yeah. shows us who the Father has always been. Yeah, like Richard says, Jesus doesn't come to change God's mind about humanity. Jesus comes to say, change humanity's mind about God. And that, that Jesus is the revelation of God the Father. When he, when, he is, when he is kissing the leper, you are seeing the Father's love. Mm -hmm. And there's no distinction between. But we will see the revelation of the, Father, of, of the fatherhood of God in Jesus. And then we'll go back to our dysfunctional abusive paradigm that, uh, that's associated with our pain and our damage and our histories and everything else? You know, uh, Americans by default have a Puritan soul. We're all Puritans to some degree or another. Even atheists are Puritan. The, the God they don't believe in is the Puritan. They're Puritan yeah, atheists. That's exactly and right. And we've inherited that. And, um, but we seem as, there seems... The, the, the conversation we're having yes. about, you know, moving beyond this and, and that ends up being birthed in the creative expression that's the shack. And, you know, and I write um, sinners in the hands of a loving God and all that. And, and I can, we have friends that, that tell this story of going through this, but it seems to be more than just a, a handful of individuals that are moving beyond the idea of God being angry, violent, and retributive. It's, it, it, you tell me what you think. It seems to me like there is more of a sea change beginning to happen. Absolutely. And I see it all over the planet. Um, I went to, for example, South Korea when the shack came out. And it was like, if you see CNN, you know, with all the television and all the reporters and all that, it was like that. And um, the top media and everything, because the shack had been such a hugely powerful book. I went back five years later for Crossroads, and same thing. But this time, one question changed in those five years that never was asked the first trip, was asked almost every interview the second trip. And the question was this, how can we heal the human soul? They didn't ask that the first time. But the second trip over, all of a sudden, there had been a, some kind of a sea change. And the question is, how do we deal with the damage? To the point where, on national TV, they're saying, do you think, is it your opinion that we are killing our own children because of the high suicide rate, because of the push for performance, and the need to save face within the culture? And um, to, be, to be invited into that space when there is this sea change happening, it's... Uh, unbelievable. And that's just representative of what's all right. happening all over the planet. So that's what we're talking about at Word of Life right now at this time. H how do we heal our soul? So, Paul Young, <laughs> how do we heal our soul? Slowly, painfully, incrementally, and always <laughs> relationally. <laughs> come on. It is, you know, if we, if we were not so magnificently created, we could have quick fixes. But we're too incredible as a being for quick fixes. And we are by nature relational beings. And one of the lies that we've been told is that we're not, especially men. We've been told that you have to add the relational component to your life uh, in order to make any kind of movement. So it's almost like 
you have to do this as part of, you know, joining the club. And, and that's a lie. The truth is you're made in the image of a God who's never been alone. You're made in the image of a God who is relational. You're not going to find anything deeper about the character and nature of God than relationship. And that relationship we're made in the image and likeness of. That's why aloneness is such a violation of relationship. And it's the first not good in scripture is aloneness. And that's why loneliness dominates the Western world because we've substituted technology and imagery for authenticity. But the crazy part of it is that we're scared of authenticity because it means exposure. And we don't realize that the whole work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to expose. Authenticity, the very opposite of the carefully curated Instagram image we put out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That song was unbelievable. That was a it, brilliant song. Oh my gosh. It captured it so <laughs> much of my history and the history of those who've grown up with, especially within religious culture. And I could track my whole life inside that song. And a lot of it is I have a drive toward authenticity, and every human being does. I guarantee it. Um, the reason you're here in part is because there is something in you that wants to be free, authentic, real, true, and you're here for that in part, but we're surrounded by ways to cover up and, and sadly theology has reinforced it. It has told us that, you know what, you're not really a good person, so we're going to teach you how to cover it up through performance. So, yeah. so, I know this is in your new book. Uh, everybody that's around Christianity for five minutes learns to say that God loves us. Yeah. And so that's immediately embraced, at least, you know, cerebrally. Uh, but what we'll do is, what we, you know, we play with the language. It's, well, God loves us. I'm not sure he likes us. Right. I'm not sure he likes me. Right. Because I love you, but I don't like you. Yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah. yeah and, and, and if somebody says that to you, it's like, dang, what a... <laughs> All right, so, so does God, we know everybody, okay, everybody knows God loves us, okay, fine. Does God like us? See, and this is, I, I did this little turn of phrase in, in the shack that suddenly become, it became this watershed, and that was, I'm especially fond of you, right? That little turn of phrase, because what it did is it took the onus off the subject loving. Well, God loves you because that's the way God is. Because that's the rules. Yeah, yeah. He has to, you know. <laughs> but it turned it from the subject loving to the object being loved. And it, and it came from my relationship with my kids, right? Which of my children do I love the most? Well, the one that I'm thinking about right now, you know. <laughs> it's, it's like I'm especially fond of you, which and, means and, I know you. And the love you. you have for your children is not, it's not a, it's not a same love. No. It's a particular love for each child. Absolutely. Uh, and we do this. We attribute to God a lesser quality of love than we have in our own lives. And if we stood back and mm -hmm. thought about it, we would go like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think I'm only scratching the surface of the love that God is. Right? In the best, in the best of my moments. And where do I find the best of my moments? in my relationship with my children and my grandchildren. Um, I have a friend who's an atheist, and when I first met him, I met him because of another friend of mine bought his soul on eBay for 504 bucks. <laughs> and um, it's, it was okay. a recession. And uh, so, so through that, I meet Matt, and the first time I actually meet him face to face, he, the first thing he says to me, he says, I'm, I'm an unbeliever, you know that, right? And I said, no, you're not. He said, yeah, yeah, I am. I said, you're not. He goes, I am so, right, because I offended him. And, um, and I said, no, I, belief is an activity. It's, it's not a category. And, and frankly, most of the people that I know who made up the categories, they're, they're struggling with doubt and unbelief. And um, um, I, he goes... Atheists wake up in the middle of the night haunted by doubt as well. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, he, he goes, what are you talking about? And I go, just tell me what you believe in. He said, you want to know what I believe in? He says, nobody asks me what I believe in. They always ask me what I don't believe in. I go, no, no, I want to know what you believe in. He goes, I believe in the way that I love my kids. Uh -huh. These are his words. 
I didn't know that I had the capacity to love like this until I had my own children. I would step in front of a bullet for them. I mean, if they're sick, I would take it. And it makes no rational sense, right? And I said, so this is, how, how would you define this? Obviously, it's not romantic love. Is it, could you define it as other-centered, self-giving love? And he said, that's exactly what it is. I just gave him the definition of agape. Yeah. Right? And so he believes in love. And guess who God is? Right? So there's a lot going on here. Now, let me give you an example of how we do this. How many of you heard, or I've heard it a lot, isn't it great how God is using you? Right? Don't you want to be used by God? Don't, don't you want to be a tool that God is using? How many of you would say to your child or your grandchild, I can't wait for you to grow up so that you can be a tool that I can use? <laughs> You're a great tool. Right? Would you say that? And yet we so glibly put it in the mouth of God. God doesn't use anybody. This is a relationship of participation. And that changes it, right? We can, we can take that language away and we can now talk about, I have been invited to participate in what God is, is up to. How cool is that? That's different than being used. And I come from a sexual abuse history. I'm not excited about being used, right? That's mm -hmm. not language that works for me at all. And yet... We seem to apply it to God. That's because, again, we've got a paradigm of a distant God watching from the infinite distance of a disapproving heart. Hmm. And most of the time, that God is disappointed and, and thankfully sent Jesus to protect me from him. And again, it messes with the things that we thought gave us certainty, which religion tends to do. And this is not about that. This is about an actual relationship of face-to-face, -face, relentless affection. This justice of God is always for you, never against you. There is no tension between mercy and justice, by the way. None at all. They are both expressions of love. If you go to a doctor, you hope that that doctor gives you, is, judges you. You hope that that doctor says, this is what is killing you. And now mercy is going to step in and restore your life. That's, that's the hope, right? Right? The justice of God is always just love. And it's always intent on restoration. Always. So the fury of God is the fury that is for you, not against you. It is never against you. Right? This is not a God who needs to punish because punishment doesn't change anything. Doesn't restore right. anything. Right. right? When God says vengeance is mine, you know what he says in the next breath? You deal with wrongs by good. You know what the vengeance is of God is? To be good to you. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense to us. You know, because how, how do you deal with that? Well, George MacDonald, who we both care for greatly, who is one who led Lewis into a deeper sense of the presence of God, he writes this, if you trust the goodness of God, you will run to this God with your arms wide open and you will say, please judge me to the core and burn out of me everything that keeps me from being fully human and fully alive. Because this God loves you and is opposed to anything that is not of love's kind. Uh, we have a daughter who for 10 years has been fighting a micropituitary adenoma. It's a brain tumor. It sits on the backside of her pituitary gland. It is so small that it's inoperable with today's technology still. And for the first couple of years, it really put her down. And uh, during that time, that little piece of tissue began to have the power to make an accusation against her soul. Hmm. Speaking of the healing of the soul. And the whisper was, you're damaged goods. You're not enough. Your damaged goods. And because of that whisper, she began to believe a lie. And because of that lie, she opened herself up without being able to stand for herself in a particular relationship that was very, very hurtful, which she is now healed from. I'm her dad. Give me the power to be a flaming fury. Hmm. 
And I would go into that little piece of tissue and I would destroy it. Because fury is the right response to things that are wrong. And give me even greater fury and I would destroy the lie that hurt the one I love. That originates in the heart of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is not because my daughter has disappointed me or because she has failed to live up to some expectation. She's my daughter. I love her because she exists, not because she has performed at all. And I would be the flame of fury that is on her behalf. This is relentless affection. This is the wrath of God that is opposed to anything in your life that keeps you from being fully alive and fully free. And if that means to expose the darkness that's in your heart, it is only because of love. It is only because of love. All right, Paul. Right here, here's, here's, our, here's our gospel reading for this week. Yeah. You, you want to walk us through some of this and help us with this? If you want. Sure. I, I mean, the... I'd rather bring my Bible up here. Yeah, thank you. Here. Yeah. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, problem number one. It's iros, which doesn't mean he takes away. He lifts up. He lifts it up because he doesn't want it to be so contaminated by the soil around it that it, it, is, it has no capacity to bear fruit, right? In fact, this whole thing is written inside the viticulture of the day. And this passage makes a huge difference if you understand that there are two seasons of pruning. And there is a whole lot more going on in this passage. There is nothing in this passage that we tend to read over top of it that says that if you don't produce fruit, boom, I'm going to send you to hell. And, and the pruning and cleaning are the same word. Correct. Yeah. And in fact, there is like 10, 12 different words in the Greek for judgment. And every single one, except one, every single one of them has restorative power in it. They're for restoration. Every single one. The one that is not is never used for God. It is only used for how we treat each other in our vengeance and retributive violence, right? Every place, which changes then your view of hell to begin with. Hell is restoration and cleansing. And if you want to hold on to your crap and your darkness, guess what? You're going to be inside the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and their presence to your darkness is going to feel like fire. And if you let go of these things, their presence is going to feel like fire that warms and heals and comforts rather than a fire that is after the darkness that I refuse to let go of. Right? This is the intention. If, I don't know if you've read Brad Jerzak's book on hell, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut. Fabulous book. Fabulous book. <laughs> One of the best that's out there yeah. right now on the whole question because he looks at the whole gamut of history and everything else. One of the things that Brad does so brilliantly is that he talks about two traditions about hell. You know, because Jeremiah was the guy. He was the guy that talked about the burning lake. He was the guy that talked about all of this. But Jeremiah was furious he was, the, he, was, he was an emotional human being. And he, and he was furious because so many times the religious system was sacrificing children. They would burn them in uh, the altar, especially in Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, which was right outside of Jerusalem, which we get Gehenna hell from. And Jeremiah's tradition was always cleansing and restoration, whatever it takes that the fire will go through and just wipe out this darkness that obliter is obliterating humanity. Every time that Jesus says the word Gehenna, hell, every single time, without exception, he quotes Jeremiah in opposition to the other tradition that says, well, and even then it wasn't eternal conscious torment. It was, you, you're going to pay for it until it's, it's, you're justly paid for and then you're going to be extinguished. That was the pharisaical side of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't where Jesus was coming from. He was coming from Jeremiah's tradition, which was restoration and wholeness. 
And that, all of a sudden, you have to step back and go like, what does that do to so, so motivation? Jeremiah is <laughs> working from this image of the Valley of Hinnom. Correct. Immediately, uh, immediately south of Jerusalem. Correct. Where uh, at one point they worshipped Molech. Molech. It was also mm -hmm. the garbage dump where the fires are never quenched. Right. And the worms, the maggots never die. Right. This is the image he's working with. Right. But uh, I went for a walk in hell. In Hannum. Mm -hmm. When were we there? Last month. Last month. Last well, month. I, I, went went to hell, to hell last I went month. to hell last month. I spent a lot more time there than you did. And it was a park. <laughs> it was a park with fountains. Yep. And people sitting on park benches. Yep. And lovers holding hands. Yep. So much for the fire that burns forever. W uh, well, the fire burns for as long as it's necessary to destroy that which it's intent to burn. Which is why we need the witness from the Christian East our Orthodox sisters and brothers, yeah. who understand sin primarily as a disease, a sickness upon the human soul for which we need a doctor. Yeah. The West, uh, being very infatuated with legal metaphors and economic metaphors, I think make it much more difficult for us to understand what God's true disposition towards sin is and what God's ultimate solution for sin is. Sure. Yep. Uh, Jesus is not so much a lawyer as he's a doctor. And, and, and also, not just a doctor. Jesus is a prophet to tell us the truth of who we are. Mm -hmm. Right? He's there to declare to you, whether you know it or not, that you are made in the image of God, that you are fundamentally good that you are kind, generous, faithful, pure of heart, that that's the truth of your being. But until you embrace the truth of your being as righteous, you will believe a lie about yourself. You will believe that the darkness in your life is actually the truth of your being. And then religion comes in and says, we'll teach you how to cover that up. And we'll teach you how to cover it up and cover it up and cover it up. But at the same time, you're going to be still thinking. As a person thinks in their heart, so are they. If you think that you are worthless and not good, guess what? You will experience life that way, even though it's absolutely a lie. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to come to teach you the truth of your being so that the way of your being can match it. Until you know that you're pure of heart, good luck with your struggle against pornography. Mm. Because you're going to just go like, I'm, I'm, I'm just a piece of garbage, right? And you're going to cycle back over it. And, the, and, you know, those kinds of addictions are all addictions so that you don't have to take the risk of real relationships. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I wrote in, I did a forward for Richard Rohr in the Trinity book. And, and in it, That's a great book. It's too. a great book. And Divine I, Dance. Yeah. And, I, and in it I said, you know, uh, porn is like bad theology, it's the imagination of a relationship without the risks of a real one. And we do that. We will substitute a mythology, both in our relationship with God, because it gives us a sense of control or power or certainty, and without any of the risks of the messiness of what real relationship and real work, doing the real work of, the, of participating with God in the healing of your soul requires. Because God's not going to fix you. I, you know, if you're like me, you would like extreme soul makeover, right? You know, come send me to Disney World and fix me by the time I get back, you know? Or give me a red or a blue pill or something. And uh, you're, just, you're just too magnificently crafted for quick fixes. It doesn't work like that. And, it, and there is a respect to the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life and, and a kindness to that respect. And we would rather God not be respectful you know, we, at least to those people. <laughs> uh, we love to see justice done on somebody else. That's Coburn. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, Paul, uh, we've been talking about uh, how to tend to our soul. Yeah. So that we can have a life that we can live. A life that we can live. Uh, why don't you take a few moments, just say whatever you want to say to us about, here, here's what I think you, you should, Here's how I think you should think about maybe caring for your soul, tending to your soul, healing your soul, however you want to say it. 
and just, just sort of say something to us, and then, and then would you pray for us? I would love to. So um, let me be, begin by saying there's absolutely no formula to this. Right. You know, as many people are as in this room, there are that many journeys mm -hmm. to wholeness. Um, the uniqueness of who you are and how uniquely you've been hurt. Because you can put 10 children in front of the same abuse and you'll have 10 lives go 10 totally different directions because of who they are. And so God, knowing you, knows how to craft a movement towards wholeness. But it will require certain things. One is, you've got to be done with secrets. You've got to come out of the dark. Right? And that's terrifying. Especially if you don't trust anybody. If, if, the, if broken trust, especially if you were sexually abused as a child, being one example, drove you into isolation and hiddenness, the risks of trust become huge. This is why we love religion, because you don't actually have to trust God. You just have to know what you're supposed to do. And the, the journey out of that darkness, you cannot do alone. You just can't do it alone. It's not going to work. You cannot heal yourself. As much as we would like God to heal us without anybody finding out about it, it is not the way this works. You are created inside community, for community, by community, and you're, as much as your hurt came through relationship, your healing will come through relationship and community. It just will. And the opportunity that you have in the world that we have with all the ways that the Holy Spirit has raised up therapeutic, AA, EMDR, touch therapy. I mean, the list is profound in terms of the things that can help you. But I'm telling you, it's going to take openness, confession, owning what you, what's happened to you which is the big question, what happened to you? And you need to be able to be in a relationship with somebody, even if the only safe person you feel like is a therapist. They're a good place to start, let me tell you. What happened to you? And you need to explore that. And that means you need to be able to let go of all the systems that you've developed that keep you safe in your own mind. And that's scary hard. Let me tell you, it is a lot of work. And it is good work because you're worth the work. Mm. You are worth the work. And if you think that only Jesus is interceding for you, don't forget the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. And therefore, by union, the Father is constantly interceding for you. This is not one part of God who's aware of what's going on in your life. This is the whole trinity in which you move and live and have your being who are set for your wholeness. Mm -hmm. That's the intent, is you to becoming fully free and fully human and fully alive. And it is the same intent that we have for our kids or our grandkids. We don't want them to be owned by us. We want them to move into face-to-face -face relationship. We don't want to use them. We want them to be fully human and fully alive. And that is the desire of God, to have full-on face-to-face relationship. Not where you've turned away. Not where you're hiding in the dark. Not when your addictions have kept you isolated. Not when your system of lies have kept you away from being able to receive things that actually will heal your heart. Which only God with skin on can do. The community and the family and, and human beings as flawed as they are being present with you in the midst of your process. This is a God who is good all the time. Amen. No evil originates with God. No darkness originates with God. God's never been religious. You know, God's never been political. This is a God who is free. And yet this God joins us in all of our messes. Our political messes, our religious messes, our relational messes, climbs into them. There was no suffering in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit until we came along. We brought darkness and suffering into the cosmos. We did that. And God did not run from that. God ran to it and into it completely. 
This is a God who is completely committed to your darkness to free you from it. Amen. And this is the beauty of this love. That you will never find a way to separate yourself from this God. You are just not that powerful. If you look at Romans 8 in the last couple verses, it has a list of the things that cannot separate you from the love of God. And in that list is included anything past and anything present, anything future. It includes not death nor life. Not death. Death cannot separate you from the love of God. Nor any created thing. Are you a created thing? Guess what? You're not powerful enough to separate yourself from the love of God. Who do you think you are? <laughs> right? You're just not that powerful. When, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he's not talking about a cross that God gives you. He's talking about a cross that others give you in a broken world. The cross that we pick up is because we live inside of a broken world. We pick up the cross of our own histories, of our family systems, of the abandonment, of the abuse, of the performance orientation, right? Because God doesn't make crosses. Only human beings make crosses. And so when Jesus says, pick up your cross, it's because he's picked up his. He has joined us in our humanity and taken on everything that we've brought to the table. This is the beauty of the love of God. A love that is so profound that when we love our children and our grandchildren, we are just scraping the surface. Just barely inching into a realization of this God who is always good in whom there is no darkness at all. And when we begin to declare that that is the God that we trust because he is good all the time and he loves us, we can then begin to let go of all the empty imaginations that raise themselves up against the knowing of God. This God you can trust completely with every part of your being, including the attached darkness that covers over the truth of who you are. You are by nature relational. You are by nature kind and good and pure of heart and faithful and furious at the things that hurt the ones you love. By nature, you were a good creation before anything got covered up mm. and broken. Amen. And that is the declaration of God to you. That is, if you want to know the truth of who you are, you'll look at Jesus. Everything that is true about him is true about you. Every way that he loves people and stands up against politics and religion, all of that is true about you. There is something in you that says, my identity is not hooked to this world system. It is embedded in the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whom I move and live and have my being, to the praise of the glory of his kindness forever. Amen. 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 Pray for us. Pray for us. Paul, so I get this incredible honor of praying for you. I met Papa God earlier. She prayed for me. Funny that her name's White. Yeah, it's great irony in that. And uh, I just, I heard, I heard that when she prays, Papa listens. It's true. And, um, and so I couldn't, I, I, I didn't want to not have her pray for me, which she did. And what she prayed happened, did it not? Okay, cool. So um, I get to pray for you, but I don't want anybody bowing their heads and closing their eyes. <laughs> bowing your head, now I understand it because it, you, know, you get to focus on something not, that's not your neighbor or whatever. But it was always a sign of shame in the early church. Because shame is a way of isolating you. And part of that is that you bow your head because you can't look in the eyes of someone else without seeing a reflection of your own self-disgust or self-loathing or low self-image, right? And uh, the early church refused to bow their heads and close their eyes for that very reason. They would lift their heads up because we are surrounded by the glory of God. Look around, right? 
If you knew the wonder of the person that you are with, you would be like John in the, in the Revelation. If you remember, every time he sees Jesus, he goes flat on the ground and Jesus would go like, John, get up, you know, it's just me. And, um, you know, and, uh, but he couldn't help himself. And there's one point in the Revelation where he, he sees him again and down he goes. And this time it's not even Jesus. It's one of us. And whoever this human being is goes, John, I'm just one of the fellow servants here. I'm, but, but John got to see the revelation of who that person was with clarity. And it so blinded him with its magnificence that he thought for sure that he was in front of Jesus. And down he went. And you are surrounded by this. When you look in a mirror, you are surrounded by this glory. And we let the mirror tell us lies. Right? And so with eyes lifted up, being surrounded by the glory of God, the revelation of Jesus that is inherent in, in you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, right? This beauty, we get to stand unashamed, naked, our lives open, open books, because that's how God made us. When he says, who told you you were naked? The answer is, I did. God is rhetorical, right? Because nobody else is there. It was either the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. Take your pick, <laughs> right? We told you you were supposed to live in a way that you're wide open, not covered up, and unashamed, right? And we get to do that. So let's stand together and do this. Papa God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, our brother, we declare our gratitude from the depths of our being that you who fully knows us yet dwells within us. And that your work is to transform us from glory to glory, not cruddy to glory, not glory to glorier, because you know the truth about us even when we do not. And you know the truth about, of who we are about every single human being on this planet who lives and moves and has their being in you. We are so grateful for your kindness and your humility that you would move into the depths of our souls in order to begin to whisper to us the truth, who you are and therefore who we are, that when we meet the fire of your judgment, we will run toward it going, please judge me to the core. Mm -hmm. And burn out of me everything that keeps me from being fully human and fully alive. And we declare that knowing what a dangerous prayer this is. Because our desire for you and for wholeness is greater than our addiction to the hiddenness and the coverings and the darkness and the secrets and the lies. We want you and everything that that means. And we declare this. We've, we declare the breaking of the agreements that we've made. The agreements in which we say, I am not worthy. Or I am not skinny enough. Or tall enough. Or I am not a boy. Or I am not whatever those I am nots are. Please continue to whisper the I am that has to be there before any I am not could exist. And may we stand in the power of your I am. And may we hear the truth of who we are. And we, may we have the power and the insight, the presence, Holy Spirit, grant to us the ability to say no to the lies. Yes. To learn to live in just the grace of one day at a time and trust you. Yes. We tear down the empty imaginations, all those future tripping things of how we're going to fail the rest of our lives 
all those horrendous events that we can imagine that are when things are going wrong and we take all of that imagination empty as it is and we say no in order to come into your presence where there's fullness of joy and stay inside today's grace only. This is the day you've made. This is the day that you are with us in, not in empty imagination. So teach us how to spend today's grace on just today. Yes, yes, yes. And be free from, the, from anxiety and the worry that comes from our need to control. Teach us. Papa, thank you for being our intercessor. And Jesus, thank you for always abiding in us, with us, and being for us. And Holy Spirit, what a tender kindness you are. You always are trying to reveal to ourselves and to the world how wonderful you think we are. We love your grace and we love your intensity. We love your kindness and your comfort, your generosity, and the ease with which you put your arms around us, even when we fight it. <sighs> Grant the, us the ability to let go of our burdens. And here, if your burden is not light and your yoke is not easy, you are picking up things that don't belong to you. We declare these things with grateful hearts. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome.